Final ending of the checkpoint, part one down below. Okay, okay, Anthony began as the employees buzzed with conversation, enjoying their meal and sharing laughs. Heather Aukoin, the head of the fabrication department, called out, everyone. Mr. Whitehead has something important to say. Listen up, please, let's have silence. Brent Collier interjected. Appreciate it, Anthony replied, finishing his drink and tossing the cup into a large trash bin. He gestured towards a significant graph displaying colorful bars stretching outwards. See this red bar? It represents our performance up to the same date last year, Anthony explained. Impressive, right? He paused, letting the nods of agreement settle. Then, he highlighted the red bar. Those figures were strong, hence, everyone received generous year-end rewards, remember? He continued. Well, they were not exactly for Christmas. Brent attempted to clarify. Nonsense, Anthony cut in sharply. They were distributed just before Christmas, effectively making them Christmas bonuses. Is anyone here bothered by calling it that? If so, feel free to return the bonus to Whitehead Generators. Anyone willing to do that? No? Good, I assumed you all appreciated those bonuses. Now, back to my point, last year's performance was solid. This year's, not so much. He then pointed to a blue bar on the graph, significantly shorter than the red bar. Why is our performance not as strong this year? Any ideas? Anthony probed. A cough broke the silence. He scanned the room, meeting the eyes of employees and supervisors alike, all returned his gaze. What has changed from last year to this? Is it a drop in demand? Our sales data strongly disagrees. Is it a supply issue? Our inventory levels say otherwise. As the transport sector stopped deliveries to our facility? Not at all. And what about our shipments to customers? Still ongoing. So, what's different? Anthony continued to press. The room remained quiet, some eyes now fixed on the ground. The only change is my father's passing. But think about it, he didn't physically manage the operations here, he wasn't loading or unloading, not handling fabrication or overseeing the assembly line. He worked from his office, ensuring orders were placed, bills and staff were paid. And that's still happening. So, how does his absence affect our production levels? Anthony challenged. After a prolonged pause, Anthony removed the bar chart and discarded it in the trash bin. This is the change that's needed, Anthony declared. Either we see the numbers rise to where they should be in six weeks, exactly at 7.43, or all of you, without exception, will lose your jobs. Any questions? No. Then back to work, he stated, striding up the metal stairs to his office. Within three weeks, thanks to a motivating breakfast meeting, Lisa reported that production had not only returned to its former level, but was on track to surpass the previous year's figures. I think a bonus is in order, Jimmy proposed. Absolutely not, Anthony retorted sharply. A bonus. For meeting basic expectations and I not confronted them with the reality of their situation, we'd still be lamenting our poor performance," he argued. So, no bonuses, and I'm even reconsidering the holiday bonuses. There will be holiday bonuses, Susan interjected. I'll forfeit my portion if necessary, but our staff will receive their dues. I thought we agreed not to call them holiday bonuses. Jimmy began. We're celebrating Christmas, and that's what they are, Christmas bonuses. Anyone bothered by the term can simply opt out, but I doubt anyone will, Anthony countered with intensity. Risking my life on that bet, are you? Jimmy quipped. Not yours, mine. Is there any other business? Susan cut through the tension. Just the matter of Anthony being stubborn, Jimmy joked. I suggest we close this meeting, Lisa added, seeking to end the discussion. Agreed, Anthony concurred. He continued to cover the utility and insurance bills for the house, even while searching for a new place for himself. Initially, he considered relocating near the factory but found the surrounding neighborhoods of Pin Oak unappealing. LG was no better, it was filled with homes that were decades old appearing neglected and worn. Susan lived in a secured community near the Hardington Acres Country Club. Anthony had a pass in his car for entry, and if it were ever misplaced, he knew Susan's security code to gain access. Cheyenne, on the other hand, had neither the pass nor the code and was still incarcerated, though not permanently. Carmen Davis, a poised woman in her middle years, exuded a warm, approachable demeanor. Unlike previous real estate agents Anthony had encountered, she focused more on understanding her clients' needs rather than imposing her own views, which Anthony appreciated greatly. In Hardington, properties are so coveted, you'd almost expect someone to pass away before one becomes available, Carmen remarked casually. However, there's a listing on Pennington. Interested in seeing it? Absolutely, responded Anthony. The house, a striking three-story structure with dark chocolate brown brick and honey brown wooden accents, caught Anthony's eye even before he stepped inside. A separate three-car garage with a living space above it complemented the main house's aesthetic, featuring the same brick and wood finishes. Upon arriving, Carmen casually mentioned, Oh, disregard that. The property is no longer on the market. Confused, Anthony pointed out the for sale sign, but Carmen playfully asserted her newfound interest in the property, captivated by its unique garage doors. Still, indulge me, Anthony said with a playful grin. I'd like to see what's captured your interest, Ms. Davis. 
The house boasted a spacious den, a potential library with built-in honey-brown shelves on three walls, and a grand stone fireplace. The kitchen was generously sized with ample counter space, though Carmen noted the dining room's modest size with a light shrug. The second floor boasted four bedrooms and two bathrooms, neatly divided across the east and west sides, each pair of bedrooms flanking a shared bathroom. Carmen floated an idea. You know, one of these could make a nice home office. Anthony retorted with a hint of jest, or it could be the end of me. Ms. Davis, please, call me Carmen, she interjected. Carmen, home is my sanctuary from work. Why would I want to mix the two? Understood, no home office then, Carmen conceded. These bedrooms are spacious, though. Shall we check out the third floor? The third floor presented two luxurious suites, each with its own fireplace and expansive bathroom featuring a whirlpool tub, a marble bench shower enclosed in glass with multiple shower heads, and a double sink vanity. Both suites boasted large bay windows with cushioned benches. One offered an eastern vista while the other presented a western panorama. Carmen remarked, It's a pity this place is off the market, her eyes widening at the size of the closet. Anthony quipped, You could fit a truck in here. Reflecting momentarily, he added, Though my ex might still manage to fill it to the brim. Carmen chuckled, my daughters were never that extravagant, but my granddaughter Carmi seems destined for a lavish wardrobe. Descending the stairs, Anthony inquired, what was the asking price, or should I say, what was it before you claimed it? 475, Carmen disclosed. Make it 490, Anthony suggested decisively. Carmen hesitated, I'll need 1% upfront as earnest money. Sure thing, should I send it to Davis Real Estate? Anthony confirmed, then swiftly completed the transaction on his phone. Later, at Cowboys BBQ, Anthony was savoring his meal when Carmen's text arrived, confirming the acceptance of their offer. Amidst his enthusiasm, he managed to smear sauce on his phone as he eagerly instructed her to proceed with the closing. Carter, Anthony, and Cheyenne's attorney once again found themselves in Judge Thuriot's chambers. Following Carter's request and minimal opposition from Cheyenne's legal representative, Judge Thuriot decided that due to Mrs. Whitehead's unavailability for the counseling session, the mandate for eight sessions was nullified. That's the kind of results I'm talking about, Mr. Fullalove, exclaimed Anthony. With the counseling requirement off the table, Carter proceeded, we need to address Mr. Whitehead's desire for a divorce. Mrs. Whitehead is contesting the divorce, interjected Cheyenne's lawyer. Judge Thuriot, after consulting with the clerk of court for St. Anne Parish, noted Mrs. Whitehead's trial was set in four months. With this timeline, he opted not to proceed with the divorce request. Your Honor, began Carter. It's all right, Anthony resignedly remarked. What's the point of divorcing if you're not planning to remarry soon? Though, I doubt I'll rush into anything again. Exactly, ditch one difficult situation, go through a contentious split, then decide it's not worth it because it's just draining resources, Carter elaborated. And before you know it, you're out shopping, meet an attractive woman with her charming daughter, and suddenly, you're smitten and can't imagine life without them. Sounds like you're speaking from experience, Anthony noted. His smile broadened when Carter flashed his wedding ring, also revealing he had become the coach for his stepdaughter's soccer team. That's interesting. Maybe she'll take to a different sport in the future. Anthony pondered. Try keeping up with a group of energetic seven-year-olds on the soccer field. It's not as easy as it looks, Carter responded with a grin. Cheyenne ended up with a substantial fine and was credited for time served, coupled with a three-year probation period. A stern warning was issued, fail a drug test, and she'd face time in a correctional facility. Having lost Anthony's personal contact, Cheyenne reached out to Whitehead Generators. Courtney Louvier, the personal assistant, informed Anthony that his estranged wife was on the line. Hello, Cheyenne, what a surprise, Anthony dryly greeted. Called your old office, that rude woman, to guard or something, said you're not there anymore, Cheyenne said sharply. DeFranco, Anthony corrected. Huh, Cheyenne asked. Her name is DeFranco. And DeFranco, Anthony clarified. And, uh, Cheyenne, where have you been? What? I've been in jail, you know, Cheyenne blurted out. I took over my father's position, remember? Anthony tried to remind her calmly. That happened before you were incarcerated again. How am I supposed to remember all that? Cheyenne retorted. And, uh, what's this about us not needing counseling anymore? You were unavailable. But, now that you're back, we can finalize the divorce, Anthony stated. Do we have to, really? Why? Cheyenne's voice broke. Anthony paused, listening to her cry. It pained him to hear the genuine sorrow in her tears, realizing she wasn't trying to manipulate him. Cheyenne, why? Why do you want to remain married? What do you mean? I love you, Cheyenne managed to say between sobs. Stop. Think about it, Cheyenne, Anthony urged. I believe you might love me. But, do you actually like me? All I can recall is the constant complaining and negativity. Please, just sign the divorce papers. You don't want to try again, Cheyenne asked weakly. Please, Cheyenne, listen, Anthony implored. I've been incredibly unhappy at work for months. But when I get home, I finally feel at peace. So, you can find peace here, Cheyenne responded, her voice tinged with bitterness. No, I simply can't do it. 
I refuse to endure another moment of this torment, Anthony declared firmly. I will stand my ground against the divorce, Cheyenne yelled back, her voice full of defiance. You hear me? I will oppose this every step of the way. When it was made clear to Cheyenne's lawyer that she would be responsible for any further cost, the lawyer promptly informed her. Cheyenne, with a tone of disdain, retorted over the phone, So, you're using financial power to manipulate me now. Because you have the funds, I have to comply. Correct, Anthony replied coolly, ignoring her provocation. You'll regret this, Anthony Whitehead, Cheyenne hissed. Mark my words, you will regret this. I've already been through the worst, but thanks for the sentiment, Anthony responded with a slight sarcasm, then added, I'm ending this call now. Anthony was aware the moment Cheyenne got the final divorce papers. His assistant informed him Cheyenne was on the phone, but before he could even greet her, she was already sobbing loudly. After a particularly exhausting day, Anthony came home to find the bulky envelope from the St. Anne's clerk of court on his kitchen counter, unopened and awaiting his attention. Yearning for something more potent than beer, he thought about driving to the nearest store to buy some strong liquor. However, he ended up at Arthur Porter's gym, where he exhausted himself on the heavy bag, followed by a long, hot shower, feeling the fatigue deep in his muscles. Back home, with his hair still damp and carrying the scent of the gym's basic soap, he stared at the envelope on the counter. Nearly fifteen years of marriage were over, not with celebration, but with anguish and silence, save for the sound of the official papers he now held. A lone tear escaped Anthony's eye as he read the stark, formal words that officially dissolved the union between Anthony Marcus Whitehead and Cheyenne Allison Frick Whitehead, leaving them legally unbound to each other. Lisa, his sister, empathized silently, while Gracie, his niece, reassured him that brighter days were ahead. Susan, embodying grace and decorum, didn't exclaim with relief upon hearing from Anthony. She serenely confirmed it was all for the better. His siblings, Jimmy, Cindy, and Barbara, were puzzled when he rang them up to share the news of his marriage ending. Really, I thought you two split ages ago, like five or six years back, Cindy inquired. Anthony found himself on the receiving end of daily calls from Cheyenne during the weekdays. She seemed unable or unwilling to grasp the reality of their divorce. Over time, these calls became less frequent, shifting from daily to sporadically. On Christmas Eve, Cheyenne announced, I've found someone new. Oh, is that so? Well, I'm happy for you, responded Anthony, his attention caught by a bright red envelope from his mother on his desk. Cheyenne retorted over the phone, aiming to provoke envy, he's much better than you ever were. Unaffected, Anthony replied, I'm sure he is, recognizing her attempt to incite jealousy, which he didn't feel. Before she could continue, Anthony interjected, that's wonderful, Cheyenne. I wish you and your new partner a joyful Christmas. Upon opening the bright red envelope, Anthony was taken aback by the 250,000 bonus check inside. He let out a whistle, smiling in approval. Beneath that envelope lay another, this one from Anne DeFranco, a former colleague. Though nearly two years had passed, she remembered to send him a festive greeting. The card displayed a photograph of Anne and her three children, all smiling broadly on horseback. Merry Christmas, Anne had penned. As you can see, we love the dude ranch so much, we saved up and visited again this year. Merry Christmas, Anthony spoke, admiring the heartfelt notes from her three kids on the card's inside cover. Before leaving his office, Anthony reached out to Oakleaf Ranch, organizing a two-week cattle drive for Anne and her kids. He booked the same getaway for Cheyenne and a guest. Anthony doubted Cheyenne would attend, suspecting she'd bring her mother over a new friend if she did. Mr. Whitehead, about this bonus. Courtney asked, her expression filled with concern. Yes, Courtney. Anthony replied with a smile. You think it's not sufficient? Oh, Mr. Whitehead, it's too generous. Courtney exclaimed. I barely do anything here. Courtney, consider it a festive gift, for whatever you celebrate. See you Monday, all right. Anthony said, then exited the office. The office floor was silent, his footsteps echoing. A vibrantly decorated Christmas tree stood in the corner, with three gifts beneath it. Two looked like they'd been frequently moved, third pristine with Anthony's name on it. He decided to leave the mysterious gift unopened. The day after Christmas, Anthony indulged in a new Bentley, its luxurious feel and smooth ride contrasting his Ferrari. He enjoyed the subtle handling, even over the speed bumps at Whitehead Generators. Now, this is true luxury, he remarked, parking the Bentley. New Year's Eve at the Hardington Acres Country Club saw Anthony mingling with a forced smile. He danced with family members and a few relatives, including his niece Gracie, and others. He would have preferred to avoid dancing with his nieces Penny and Stacy, who mirrored their mother Cindy's narcissistic traits. At midnight, amidst family, he joined in the countdown and cheered Happy New Year. Gracie was absent from the crowd, a usual preference for her. Anthony found her on the back porch, captivated by the fireworks. Happy New Year, he greeted Gracie, joining her to watch the sky illuminate. A lovely young woman shifted her attention from the dazzling display of fireworks and offered a smile. He welcomed her approach, accepting her brief embrace and gentle peck on the cheek. Happy New Year, Uncle Anthony, Gracie said with a nod. About to head out. Everything okay with you? Anthony inquired. Uh-huh, she confirmed. 
Happy New Year, he repeated, standing near the door to the grand ballroom. This year's going to be better, Uncle Antony, Gracie murmured with a hint of hope. Now, almost a year later, Anthony Whitehead didn't dwell on his niece's hopeful words. Instead, he felt an overwhelming fatigue taking hold. I need a break, Anthony realized. I'm always at my desk, approving others' time off. It's my turn for a break. However, sitting at his desk, scanning through figures and targets, Anthony struggled to settle on a vacation idea. Dude ranches were immediately dismissed, he wasn't fond of horses due to their smell. Fly fishing in a mountain stream brought thoughts of mosquitoes and chilly waters, both unattractive prospects to him. Alpine skiing was no better, skiing meant dealing with the cold and snow. The French Quarter in New Orleans conjured images of dense, impolite crowds which was unappealing. Cruises didn't interest him either, his mother's constant chatter about cruise buffets and her imaginary weight gain left him unenthusiastic. Amusement parks meant dealing with heat and crowds. Following a family tragedy, Anthony and Cheyenne had taken Gracie and Lisa to an amusement park in Florida. Enduring days with a distressed child and a grieving mother was a profound challenge. Those moments continually tugged at his heartstrings for the frightened, young girl. Yet, after the challenging time ended, Gracie's embrace and whispered thanks to Uncle Antony made the hardships bearable. That single moment of gratitude made all the discomfort worthwhile, and he would willingly do it all over again for her. But Gracie was no longer that little girl. Thanks a lot, Dad, Anthony murmured in the solitude of his office, his voice laced with a mix of gratitude and sarcasm. At 3.46 p.m., Brent knocked on the door, stating that the last of the time cards were processed. Thank you, Mr. Collier, Anthony replied, still focused on the shipping rate spreadsheet. Brent made a snide remark under his breath, which Anthony chose to ignore. Anthony then proceeded to update the time cards, ensuring each employee reached the full 40-hour mark for the week. He meticulously reviewed each card before signing off as Anthony M. Whitehead and closing up for the day. Navigating through the dimly lit shop, Anthony's gaze fell upon the Christmas tree, its lights blinking forlornly in the corner, with two gifts beneath it. One was for an absent employee, and the other, intriguingly marked for Anthony W. from an unknown sender, remained untouched by him. After setting the alarm and making a final check of the premises, Anthony stepped out into the chilly December night. At the gym, he met Jake Porter, Arthur Porter's son, and exchanged a nod of acknowledgement before focusing on his workout, alternating between the heavy and speed bags, improving his pace despite the mocking comments from a younger onlooker. Later, at the country club, Anthony was pleasantly surprised to see his niece Gracie and her friend arrive in a green Mustang. Bracing against the cold, he greeted them warmly. The valet wished him a happy new year as he handed over the parking stub. When Gracie's friend introduced herself as Nancy Hebert, Anthony inquired about their relationship, to which Nancy confidently replied that they were a couple. Inside the country club, Anthony observed as Nancy attentively helped Gracie with her coat and led her by the hand, showcasing their close bond. Thank you, God, Anthony whispered, someone to look after her. At the coat check, a young woman with warm brown eyes and an engaging smile greeted Anthony. Her smile, broad and genuine, revealed a charmingly misaligned tooth as she wished him a happy new year. In the ballroom, Anthony noticed his mother conversing with Joanna and Barney Siegel but their daughter, Barbara, was nowhere in sight. As if on cue, Barbara appeared, joining the group just as Anthony approached. Mother, where's your walker? Hi, Anthony, Barbara said, trying to catch his attention. Oh, hi, uh, Betty, right. Anthony responded, feigning confusion. Susan informed Anthony that Cheyenne was also at the party and heading their way, adding that she never understood what Anthony saw in her. Saw a lot of myself in her, Anthony retorted playfully. Incorrigible, Susan said, dismissing the subject as she walked off. Hi Anthony, Cheyenne greeted with a knowing smile, making her presence known. Hi Cheyenne, Anthony replied. So, uh, where's, oh dear, what was his name? Roland, Cheyenne suggested. Cheyenne's behavior hinted at her inebriation, her words slurred, and she teetered on her high heels. Despite boasting about her younger partner, Anthony sensed her deep-seated discontent. Their conversation made Anthony feel confined, not out of jealousy for Cheyenne or Roland, her companion, but out of a sense of pity and a misguided sense of responsibility for her sadness. Well, Happy New Year, Anthony offered as Roland approached with a troubled expression and an uneven walk, signaling he too had indulged too much in the festivities. Roland, how's it going? Anthony greeted with a forced smile, offering his hand. Cheyenne was just sharing how content you both are together. Is that so? Roland replied, casually draping an arm around Cheyenne's waist, nearly causing them to stumble. Anthony quickly steadied Roland, sparing them a slight mishap and some embarrassment. Absolutely, Anthony continued in a friendly tone. She mentioned you're quite the catch, far more than I could ever be. Honestly, I never was quite right for Cheyenne, but if you make her happy, that's fantastic. The band, featuring a slender lead singer, played a lively mix suitable for dancing. Anthony enjoyed the music, dancing with his nieces Penny and Stacy, his sisters Cindy, Barbara, and Lisa, and his mother. Gracie, glowing with joy, danced gracefully with her friend. 
For several songs, Anthony simply observed, admiring the pair's evident happiness. Jimmy, Anthony's younger brother, made a scene, insisting on speaking with Gracie to make amends, a part of his recovery process. The situation escalated quickly, resulting in Lisa striking Jimmy, sending him to the floor. Before Anthony could step in, Susan Whitehead calmly instructed Jimmy to leave. Anthony, sitting back, watched the scene unfold, feeling a mix of concern and relief as Nancy comforted Gracie. He felt grateful for Nancy's presence in Gracie's life. Later, Nancy and Gracie returned to the dance floor, their spirits lifted. Anthony and Lisa exchanged smiles, watching them enjoy the music. Let's lighten things up. Nancy shouted to the band, then Anthony, seizing the moment, invited his mother to dance, energizing the floor. As the evening wound down, Anthony left the ballroom, not having seen Roland or Cheyenne since their initial encounter. He pondered over Cheyenne's ongoing club membership and how she managed it, recalling her past criticisms. He also noticed the coat check attendant's smile, which seemed polite yet distant. When Anthony inquired about her distress, the girl unfolded her tale. Her boyfriend had taken her car while she was working and now wasn't responding to her calls or texts. Anthony offered his phone, suspecting the boyfriend was ignoring her. His hunch proved right when the boyfriend, Trey Edmonton, answered on the third ring. Anthony, feigning a tough demeanor, assured Trey that he would ensure the girl's safe return. The girl, with her deep brown eyes wide, listened as Anthony ended the call. Ignoring his own ringing phone, Anthony informed her that Trey seemed inebriated. As her phone began to ring, he offered her a lift home. The journey from the country club to her apartment took about 24 minutes. During the ride, Anthony learned she was 18, named Nessie Bro, living with her family in a cramped apartment, and was striving for a full-time position at the country club after earning her jet. Observing her modest attire struggling to contain her figure, Anthony felt Nessie was too casual a name for her, she was definitely a Vanessa. Back at her apartment, Vanessa took Anthony's phone to add her number, amusing him. She then surprised him with a kiss, stirring a strong reaction. Her lips were lush and soft, reminiscent of those coveted by many for their plush appearance. Her kiss was gentle yet passionate, leaving a lingering touch as they parted. On his drive home, Anthony spotted a compact car stopped by the police, with a young man in the back who he suspected might be Vanessa's now ex-boyfriend. His arousal hadn't subsided by the time he parked his Bentley in the garage, and it lingered as he brushed his teeth. Tucked into his expansive bed, Anthony mused over those extended bouts of excitement that TV ads cautioned about. By 11.12 the next morning, Anthony's phone pinged with Vanessa's name on the display. He briefly toyed with the idea of setting brown-eyed girl by Van Morrison as her ringtone. Hi, came the cheerful voice as he answered. Hey, I was wondering, what are you up to for lunch? My mom's making that traditional New Year's meal, you know, with ham, black-eyed peas, and cabbage. And it's not that ordinary cabbage, my mom's is the best. She cooks it with a heap of bacon, it's amazing, and with applesauce too. Want to come over? Vanessa blurted out excitedly. Vanessa, do you realize how old I am? Anthony inquired, slightly amused. No, not exactly, she replied. Darling, I'll be hitting 42 this February 27th, Anthony revealed. Oh, but 42-year-olds need to eat too, right? She questioned, a hint of playfulness in her tone. Absolutely, we probably eat more than we should, Anthony chuckled. Great, then. Let's meet for lunch at 1, Vanessa suggested. With no other plans, Anthony figured he'd accept the invitation, enjoy the meal, express his gratitude to Vanessa and her mother, and then head off. He noticed Burns and Burns Grocery was open. His phone listed some wines that paired well with ham, so Anthony browsed the aisles and eventually selected one of the recommended bottles. As he turned around, he also picked up a six-pack of St. Elizabeth Lager. Rounding a corner, he inadvertently encountered the bakery section just as the baker was setting out steaming loaves of French bread on the display. Perfect timing, Anthony exclaimed, eliciting a hearty laugh from the baker. Then, near the wine aisle, Anthony's eyes were caught by the neatly arranged bouquets of fresh flowers. Do grocery stores sell flowers? Valentine's Day. Best deals right here, a young store clerk informed Anthony. Flower shops. What do they charge? Twenty. Thirty dollars. Here, it's just fourteen ninety-nine. Really? He was holding beer, wine, and bread as he approached the checkout. Suddenly, he dashed back to the floral section and picked up two bouquets, each in a vase, one a vibrant mix, the other pure white roses. Not everything. The weary cashier asked with a smile as Anthony hurried back with the flowers. I think so, he replied. Those are pretty. Too, huh? Someone might get envious, she commented, scanning the items. Could be quite the scene, Anthony joked. Better stay out of trouble, she said with a wink. Where were you when I needed advice during my divorce? Anthony bantered, and she chuckled. In his car, Anthony removed the price tags from the flowers. He carefully placed the vases on the passenger side of his luxury car and headed to the apartment. Hey, Vanessa greeted him joyfully at her door. Hi, Anthony responded, presenting her with the white roses. These are for you. Vanessa resembled her mother, Natalie, with similar features and expressions. Natalie warmly welcomed Anthony, then playfully scolded him for bringing wine, beer, and bread. 
Look what he got me, Vanessa boasted, showing off the roses. Wow, those are beautiful, Natalie admired, caressing a petal. I'll be right back, Anthony said. Oh, you shouldn't have, Natalie said when Anthony returned with the second bouquet. Are you serving dinner? Oh, sure thing, Anthony remarked. Meet Clarissa and Bunny, this is Tony, Vanessa introduced Anthony to two cheerful girls. Nice to meet you, Anthony, he responded with a smile. Nope, I'll call you Tony, Vanessa said, giving him a friendly peck on the cheek. Bunny, can you tell your dad it's almost dinner time? Natalie instructed the younger girl. Of course, Bunny replied, dashing down the corridor. Anthony guessed that the neighbors below the Arnaud's place probably weren't fans of the noise Bunny made when she ran. All right, all right, no jumping around now, or I'll have to tickle you back, got it. Anthony overheard a man's voice. Bunny hurried back into the cozy living room, laughing. Shortly after, a stout, swift-moving man entered. No way, Nessie, save me. Bunny yelled, playfully evading her father. What did he say to you? Vanessa inquired with a grin. Hello, I'm Frank. Nice to meet you, Frank Arnaud introduced himself, reaching past Vanessa to playfully catch Bunny. Stop, Dad. Bunny protested, giggling as her father lifted her in his arms. What did I tell you, eh? Hey. Frank teased, giving her a gentle pat and a loud kiss on her cheek. Hi Anthony, how's it going? Frank greeted, extending a friendly hand. I'm great, thanks. And you? Anthony replied, shaking Frank's hand. The meal was a festive affair, filled with laughter and lively conversation. They shared wine, with everyone getting a taste, including Bunny and Clarissa, who both grimaced at the wine's flavor and quickly washed it down with overly sweet iced tea. Oh, he brought beer too. Nessie, you should bring him around more often. Frank commented cheerfully when Natalie mentioned the St. Elizabeth lager Anthony had brought along with the wine and bread. Okay, Vanessa replied. Wow, we've got banana pudding. Anthony, you into banana pudding? Natalie inquired. Who doesn't love banana pudding? Anthony exclaimed. While enjoying banana pudding and coffee, Anthony learned about Vanessa's childhood and was shown photos of her as a charming little girl. He also listened to stories about Frank's former wife, Bunny, and how Clarissa's mother had abruptly left them. I'm so tired, really exhausted from being on my feet all day, Frank announced. What's your job? Anthony queried. My father's a mailman, Bunny stated proudly. But you said your name was Anthony. Natalie questioned. It seems Vanessa prefers Tony, Anthony remarked with a grin. He smiled more broadly as Vanessa leaned against him, resting her head on his shoulder. Coming home, I'd hear, Dad, I'm so hungry, and then there's this little one. When was that diaper last changed? Frank recounted his daily experiences. I lived right next door, those apartments were tiny, right? Natalie reminisced with a smile. Yes, they were, Frank agreed. And it feels even smaller now. What do you mean? Vanessa inquired, lifting her head. It looks like you're going to have a new little brother or sister, seems about five or six months along, Frank boasted. Really? Vanessa exclaimed in surprise. Gradually, their lunch moved from the dining area to the living room. Anthony found himself squeezed into a corner of the sofa, with Vanessa snuggled against him. When Anthony mentioned he was the chief operating officer at Whitehead Generators, Frank only noted its location. It's not on my delivery route. I think Sharon covers that area, Frank pondered. Anthony felt a need to see more modest in this family's presence so he shared about his time working for St. Anne's Parish before his father passed away. Civil engineering, right. I remember you, Frankie remarked, glancing at Anthony. You look different, though. Have you lost weight? He inquired with concern. As Anthony was leaving, Vanessa clung to him tightly. He grabbed his long coat, and Vanessa quickly followed suit, wearing her own coat. Where are we headed? Anthony asked her. I was about to ask you the same, she replied with a smile, linking her arm with his. I can't remember the last time I saw a movie, Anthony mused aloud. Outside the Joy 4 Cinema in LG, Louisiana, Anthony and Vanessa stood close together, bracing against the cold wind from the Atchafalaya. The queue for tickets was long, with nearly 40 people ahead of them. In the line, Anthony noticed a familiar blonde, her dark roots showing. The man she was with wasn't Roland. They were openly affectionate, seemingly oblivious to their surroundings. Anthony felt a pang of discomfort at the sight of his ex-wife, Cheyenne, behaving so openly. It reminded him of the times during their marriage when she would be elusive about her whereabouts. She often had ready excuses or would become defensive, asserting her independence. Seeing her now, Anthony couldn't help but wonder if this behavior had been a pattern even during their marriage. But, Vanessa exclaimed, shivering as a blast of cold wind swept through the parking lot. Anthony wrapped his arms around her, trying to warm her up. Her nose was turning red, and he gently kissed it, making her smile. At that moment, Cheyenne, engaged in a heated exchange with someone, turned and saw Anthony. Her confident look faltered, replaced by a flash of concern, then quickly turned to disdain. Is this one of Gracie's little friends? Cheyenne asked with a sharp tone, her bright red nail pointing at Vanessa. Is this Vanessa bro? Anthony greeted with a smile. Vanessa, meet Cheyenne Whitehead, my former wife. And sorry, I didn't catch your name, young man. It's Tim, he replied nervously. Pleasure, Tim, I'm Anthony Whitehead, Anthony responded warmly. By the way, where's Roland? 
He's out of commission today, Cheyenne replied, dismissively turning away from Anthony and Vanessa. As they moved slowly in line, Anthony turned to Vanessa to discuss their movie choice, making it clear she had the final say. Inside, Anthony, Vanessa, Cheyenne, and Tim ended up in the concession line together. Tony, could I get? Vanessa started, glancing over the menu. Dear, pick anything you like, Anthony reassured her with a smile. Tony, Cheyenne exclaimed in surprise, staring at them incredulously. Let's keep moving, Anthony said with a nod, urging the line forward. Last time I called you Tony, you nearly lost it, Cheyenne remarked. Don't recall that, Anthony brushed off, maybe because I didn't feel for you as I do for Vanessa. Ah, Tony, Vanessa exclaimed, embracing Anthony tightly. Don't get too comfortable, Cheyenne scorned Vanessa. He'll leave you once the novelty wears off. That would only happen if she behaves poorly, Anthony retorted, urging Cheyenne to move ahead in line. Why don't you get lost? Cheyenne snapped back. After the movie, Anthony gently reminded Vanessa of his work commitments the next day, parting with tender kisses full of promise. Driving from Vanessa's place, Anthony visited his mother, Susan, who had coffee ready. Over coffee, he recounted the encounter with Cheyenne at the Joy Four Theater. Susan simply hummed in response, absorbing the news. So, I'm there, thinking to myself, did she ever step out on me? Like she's doing with that Roland guy. Anthony shared. It's all in the past now, but still. No, not in the first couple of years you two were together, Susan revealed. How do you even know that? Anthony questioned. Susan slid her coffee cup toward him, then pulled back from the counter. Anthony fixed a cup of coffee for his mother and refilled his own. He made sure to switch off the coffee maker. Time for a fresh pot. Susan inquired, re-entering the kitchen area, clutching a small plastic folder. No, mother. Besides, I thought caffeine wasn't good for you seniors. Isn't it bad for the bladder and all? Anthony joked. Anthony Marcus Whitehead. Susan exclaimed, playfully hitting him with the plastic folder. I can't believe I raised someone like you. The folder came from a private investigator, Reynolds Reynolds, whom Anthony's father, Marcus Whitehead, had hired to watch Cheyenne Allison Frick Whitehead. His surveillance went on for 27 months until Marcus decided to stop it. She had a thing for squandering your money on trivial things, but no, she was faithful, Susan finished. Trust me, if there had been any infidelity, we wouldn't have hesitated to tell you. Actually, we almost had to dissuade your father from reporting our substance use to the authorities. How did you manage that? Anthony inquired, scanning the report. Just brought up our own wild days with drugs, Susan casually said. You and Dad. Anthony looked up, astonished. The 70s were a different era, Susan remarked. Oh, wow, you and Dad, in polyester, dancing to eight tracks, dabbling in illicit substances. Anthony chuckled. Eight tracks, what a pointless gadget. Moreover, I pointed out to your father that if Cheyenne was using, you might be too, Susan mentioned nonchalantly. Even though he was eager to rid you of that troublesome girl, having her arrested could have implicated you as well. And Dad agreed with that. Anthony asked, closing the folder. Your father cared deeply for you, Anthony. It might not have seemed like it, but he truly did, Susan offered, pausing before adding, are you sure you don't want more coffee? The next day, Anthony started with an intense workout at Arthur Porter's gym. Following a revitalizing session with Randy, the masseur, and a quick rinse, he felt primed for the New Year's first business day. Arriving at Whitehead Generators, Anthony felt a sense of pride seeing the almost full employee parking lot, indicating minimal absences. With resolve, he exited his Bentley, bracing against the cold January gusts. Mr. Collier, to my office, Anthony commanded as he navigated the workspace to the stairs leading to the offices. Of course, Brent Collier replied, his tone dripping with sarcasm. Stay standing, Anthony instructed as Brent attempted to sit. This will be brief. Yes, Brent inquired, his smirk returning. There are going to be changes, Anthony stated, cutting off Brent's attempt to sit again. The first order is your termination. Terminated, Brent's expression turned to shock. Terminated. Your smirking, condescension, and disrespect are unacceptable, Anthony declared with a satisfied grin. Mr. French will take you to clear out your locker and escort you off the premises. You can't be serious, Brent stuttered. Oh, I am very serious, Anthony retorted firmly. Thank you, that's all. But, my job, your father promised. Brent tried to protest. Anthony cut in, I've reviewed your records, there's no mention of any such promise. If you can show any proof of my father's promise, we might discuss. Otherwise, we're done here. Good luck with the team, Brent said bitterly. They were loyal to me, you know. Those men are committed to their work and families, Mr. Collier. Now, I'd appreciate it if you'd leave my office, Anthony said firmly. A message saying morning Tony appeared on his cell phone, bringing a smile to Anthony's face. Good morning, he texted back. This me, came Vanessa's playful reply. Anthony pondered her question, his smile growing. In his mind, he replayed their cinematic encounters, where her kisses were unforgettable. That initial kiss after their New Year's celebration, right at her doorstep, was genuinely heartfelt. Her kisses during the movie had been tender and full of promise, an exquisite blend of sweetness and passion. He remembered how she combined popcorn and chocolate candies, creating a unique taste sensation that lingered during their kisses. 
Anthony's thoughts then drifted to a more recent memory, where Vanessa's warmth and playful touch had sparked a rush of excitement. Yes, I do miss you, he typed back. Soon after, he received a selfie from Vanessa, blowing a kiss with a playful caption that made him grin. Good morning, Mr. Whitehead. How was your new year? Courtney Louvier inquired, snapping Anthony back to reality. Absolutely amazing, Anthony replied, still distracted by his phone. How about yours? Courtney, taken aback by Anthony's frankness, stuttered in response. Anthony's gaze returned to his phone, lost in thoughts of Vanessa and the elegance a diamond choker would add to her slender neck. Suddenly motivated, Anthony announced, I need to run an errand, as he reached for his coat. Anthony inquired if Vanessa had work that day, to which she replied that she was due at 1 o'clock. She was frantically trying to find a co-worker who could give her a lift because her car was seized after her ex-boyfriend was caught driving under the influence. I'll take you, Anthony offered via text. Yay, Vanessa replied, sending a flurry of affectionate emojis. At 11, Bunny welcomed Mr. Tony at the door of the apartment with a hug, followed by Clarissa and Natalie. Vanessa greeted Tony with a hug and a peck on the cheek. Tony then shared a farewell hug with everyone before they could depart from the cozy and tidy apartment. They lunched at Dusty's Country Kitchen and then headed to the Acres Country Club. Vanessa beamed, leaning in to give Anthony a peck. I, uh, remember, you sent me that photo, and I thought, you know what that neck needs. Anthony fumbled, searching in his coat. My neck. Vanessa laughed. Did you really notice my neck? So, I got you this, Anthony revealed, presenting a slender box. Vanessa was astounded by the sight of the elegant gold choker adorned with three diamonds. Tony, this is genuine, right? She inquired, her gaze fixed on him rather than the necklace. Of course, it's genuine, Anthony chuckled. Why? You think I'd risk tarnishing your neck? What does this mean? Vanessa probed, gesturing towards the necklace. It means, Vanessa, I like you. I'm happy we met. I suppose it means I'm your boyfriend, Anthony expressed hesitantly. You're already my boyfriend, Vanessa affirmed. She blushed, speaking softly, I don't share special moments like the one in the movies with just anyone, you know. Give me a kiss, Anthony said gently, or you'll be late. Oh no, Vanessa exclaimed, fumbling with the door. What time are you leaving work? Anthony shouted before she shut the door. I'll send you a message, Vanessa assured him. Back at his desk, Anthony's body was there, but his mind wandered. He imagined himself in a dimly lit cinema next to a young woman, their eyes glued to the screen. In his daydreams, he was cruising in a Bentley, sharing tender moments with her. Department of Labor on Line 3, Courtney informed him over the intercom. After addressing the call, Anthony noticed another line flashing. Courtney announced that Cheyenne was waiting on the second line. You better not spill anything to Roland about my connection with Tim, got it. Cheyenne warned. Why would I ruin Roland's blissful ignorance? Anthony replied with a grin. He's oblivious to his partner's deceit. Why would I spoil that for him? Without waiting for her answer, Anthony hung up. Courtney wished him a good evening as he left at half past five. Later, wandering through the quiet factory at dusk, Anthony pondered over starting a night shift. The thought was practical, idle machinery meant lost revenue. The fixed costs remained constant, while the operational and labor expenses were manageable. Increased output would justify these minor hikes in costs. Close to 10, Anthony received a text from Vanessa, stating she would finish work soon. He quickly changed into casual shoes and grabbed his jacket, hurrying out. Vanessa greeted him energetically as she opened the car door herself. You need to take set off, Anthony told her. I might be free after Friday, Vanessa responded, a hint of sadness in her voice. That's unfortunate, dear, Anthony expressed with feigned empathy. At his niece Gracie's birthday on Saturday, Vanessa casually called him Tony, causing a stir among the guests. No one calls me Tony, Anthony responded with a smile, affectionately pecking Vanessa on her nose. Well, I do, she chuckled, playfully surprising him with a nose lick. As they settled into his Bentley, Vanessa expressed her fondness for it, favoring it over his other car. She fiddled with the thick gold choker at her neck, then gazed at him with her large, expressive brown eyes, softly suggesting they head to his place. In his bedroom, Anthony was captivated by the vision of a striking blonde woman lying on his bed. Her figure was a harmonious blend of curves, from her full upper body to her defined waist and fuller hips, framed by her long, slender legs. Her blonde hair cascaded in waves, adding to her allure. She seemed a bit insecure about her appearance, attempting to shield herself from his view. Vanessa, you are stunning, Anthony whispered as he approached her on the bed, noticing she still wore the gold choker. To make her feel more comfortable, he dimmed the light. The soft glow from the bay window illuminated her, her face still tinged with unease. Stunning, he murmured again, leaning in for a gentle kiss. Do you have protection? Vanessa inquired nervously. Yes, Anthony reassured her, as he gently laid her down, her blonde hair spread across the pillows. They exchanged a tender kiss, and she tensed slightly under his touch. A soft gasp escaped her as he carefully caressed her, and she let out a soft exclamation when he intensified his attention. Vanessa's response grew more intense, signaling her pleasure. Anthony was attuned to her reactions, moving with care and attention to ensure her comfort and enjoyment. Ugh. Oh my god. 
Vanessa exclaimed as Anthony playfully pinched her side, causing her to squirm away slightly. Do you like that? Anthony teased, already knowing the answer. Uh-huh, Vanessa replied, her breath quickening, eyes shut tightly. Vanessa couldn't help but giggle when Anthony's teasing touches wandered over her stomach. She laughed again, feeling a ticklish sensation as he playfully poked her belly button. Her blonde hair appeared a shade darker, dampened by the sweat of their playful tussle, the pale sunlight streaming through his bay window casting soft highlights. Anthony gently coaxed her legs apart, sending a gentle breeze across her skin that made her shiver. The air was filled with the intense scent of their shared excitement, a tangy, invigorating aroma. Anthony's fingers danced lightly, tracing her skin, causing a shiver to run through her. Ugh, oh my god. Vanessa cried out, overcome with a wave of euphoric sensations. Anthony found a particularly sensitive spot and focused there, his touch light and teasing. Vanessa's reactions grew more intense, her body shaking and shivering with each wave of laughter and joy that coursed through her. After a moment of playful torment, Anthony paused, noticing Vanessa's breaths coming in steady, albeit heavy, rhythms, her chest rising and falling softly. He then got up, went to the bathroom, and returned with a damp cloth, gently wiping Vanessa's forehead. Huh, Vanessa murmured, blinking slowly as Anthony tended to her with the cloth. You really got into it, Anthony said with a chuckle, but was interrupted as Vanessa playfully pulled him into a deep, intense kiss. Their kiss was wild and unbridled, filled with playful nips and tugs. Breaking away with a mischievous grin, Vanessa spoke in a commanding tone, let's be careful, okay. Oh, Anthony responded with a playful grin. All right then. With urgency mixed with excitement, they continued their playful and intimate dance, lost in each other's company. Anthony carefully prepared, his anticipation evident. Vanessa watched, her eyes wide, then opened her arms to welcome him. This is my first time, she whispered, her voice tinged with nervous excitement as they came closer. They both gasped as they connected, a moment of intense emotion and physical union. Vanessa adjusted her position slightly, her movements drawing him in deeper. They were completely enveloped in the sensation, their breaths mingling in short gasps. I love you, Vanessa murmured close to his ear, her voice filled with affection. Do you hear me, Tony? I love you. Love you too, Anthony replied, his voice strained with emotion. He felt the surge of intensity, the warmth and closeness enveloping them both. Vanessa's soft murmur broke the silence as Anthony moved with care. Wait, we're not done, are we? She asked, her voice a mix of eagerness and anticipation. As they found their rhythm once more, Vanessa's expressions of joy filled the room. Anthony, driven by deep emotion and connection, moved with a passionate intensity. Finally, Anthony expressed his climax with a heartfelt exclamation, the moment overwhelming in its intensity. After catching his breath, he carefully disengaged, handling the aftermath with care, his movements slow and thoughtful. Returning to the room, he found Vanessa playfully searching through the nightstand, her cheerful demeanor undimmed. Do we have more? Oh, wait, I need a moment, she said with a light laugh, dashing off. The comforter bore a small, pink mark, a silent testament to their shared experience. Anthony looked at it, his feelings a complex tapestry of pride and tender reflection. At the month's close, the first board meeting of the year convened. Susan, with a serious demeanor, acknowledged Jimmy's apologies for his inappropriate behavior at the New Year's Eve festivity. Lisa also accepted Jimmy's apologies with a nod. As the CEO and CFO, Susan and Lisa proposed a feasibility study for introducing a second shift in their manufacturing operation. Anthony, feeling a surge of frustration, questioned the need for such a study but found himself in the minority, despite holding Cindy and Barbara's votes by proxy. The decision to delay action until the study's completion was supported by Susan, Lisa, Jimmy, and Lisa on behalf of Gracie. Post-meeting, only Susan and Anthony remained in the boardroom. Susan, retrieving a manila folder from her bag, slid it across to Anthony, revealing it contained information on Vanessa and Bro. She expressed concerns over Vanessa's incomplete education and her ex-boyfriend. Trey, known for his reckless behavior. Anthony, taken aback by the investigation into his personal life, confronted Susan. Susan justified her actions, citing Anthony's past and even mentioned scrutinizing Gracie's friend, who turned out to be trustworthy. Anthony, trying to defend Vanessa's credibility, was cut short by Susan's firm stance on vetting his relationships, indicating a protective, albeit controlling, maternal instinct. As seasons changed, Anthony found joy at his niece's wedding, walking Nancy down the aisle, surrounded by the warmth of family and friends, feeling a sense of belonging and happiness. After the ceremony, Jimmy went over to Nancy and Gracie, expressing his pride and offering his best wishes for their happiness ahead. Anthony noticed the sorrow in his younger brother's eyes as he walked away. Vanessa held Anthony's hand gently, looking up at him as he moved to the aisle. I love you, Anthony whispered, embracing Jimmy. I love. Jimmy started, his voice breaking with emotion. Remember to call your sponsor, a waiter suggested as Jimmy hurried away from the gazebo at the country club. On May 27th, Natalie Arnaud welcomed her daughter Claire Marie Arnaud into the world. 
On June 1st, Anthony teased Jimmy, calling him a sucker, before he hurried out of Whitehead Generators, descending the metallic stairs. Anthony then drove a rented motor home to the Spanish Armada apartment complex. Before he could fully park, Vanessa excitedly met him with her suitcase. All of this is just your stuff, Anthony joked. Yep, just mine. Bunnies and Clarissas are still upstairs, Vanessa replied with a grin. Laughing, Anthony retorted, what a chaos you are. I can't wait to see your adorable little sister. Together, they went upstairs where Natalie beamed with pride, showing off her newborn. Anthony, thanks a bunch for helping out with the girls, Frank said as Anthony collected the girls' luggage. Unbeknownst to Bunny and Clarissa, a delightful surprise awaited them. Their excitement overflowed at the sight of their big sister and Mr. Tony by the school's parking lot on the last day of school. Mr. Tony, Nessie, what are you doing here? Bunny exclaimed, embracing them. Guess who might be heading to Disney World? Mr. Tony playfully hinted. Are we really going to Disney World? Bunny shrieked in excitement. Mr. Tony, are you serious? Clarissa asked, her voice filled with wonder and disbelief. After a week on the road, four sun-kissed, joyful travelers merged onto I-10, heading west. Bunny nestled against Mr. Tony, then pecked his cheek. Mr. Tony, she inquired. Yes, Anthony responded, signaling to merge into the right lane. You should marry Nessie, Bunny stated. Why do you say that, Bunny Francis Teresa Arnaud? How did he know my full name? Bunny exclaimed, turning to Clarissa and Vanessa, who were lounging in the back of the motor home. I didn't tell him, Clarissa responded. Me neither, Vanessa added, it must have been mom or dad. But Mr. Tony, how did you know my name? Bunny persisted. Santa Claus, Anthony joked, avoiding the admission that he had learned her name from a detailed briefing by his mother about Bunny's sister. Now, why should I marry Nessie? Because she loves you, and I love you too, Bunny declared. That's a compelling reason, Anthony acknowledged. So, will you? Bunny probed. Perhaps, Anthony replied, glancing at the rearview mirror. Now, move over, will you? Arriving at the apartment, Anthony was relieved to exit the driver's seat. Waking Bunny and Clarissa, he found them somewhat irritable, a mood not improved when their father feigned ignorance of their week-long absence. Girls, Natalie greeted with a smile. Your daddy's just joking. We've missed you a lot. Mr. Tony received three drowsy hugs and a sleepy kiss. Descending the stairs, Anthony felt the tension of the drive. Returning the motor home and stepping back into his house, he was struck by a sense of solitude. Mother, I'm back, he announced on the phone to Susan. Oh, you didn't notice I was away, Susan joked. Really? Oh, I'm sorry, is your memory slipping? Anthony retorted. Susan, I hope when you have children, they're just like you, she snapped back. Love you too, Mom, Anthony chuckled. Thank goodness, Jimmy exclaimed when Anthony confirmed he was back. I seriously don't understand how you manage every single day. I'm on the edge here. Presuming you had anything to lose in the first place, Anthony shot back. During their week-long visit, Anthony and Vanessa shared the large bed, but with Bunny and Clarissa nearby, they kept to just holding each other and light kisses. Back in his own bed, Anthony found himself missing the scent of Vanessa and the warmth of her close by. The next morning, Bunny greeted him at the door of their place with a big smile and a hug. Vanessa, oh, she's still asleep, Bunny informed him. Then go wake her, I need to ask her something, Anthony instructed. Bunny, if you pounce on me, you're in trouble, they heard Vanessa shout from inside. Why is Anthony here? Vanessa inquired, looking disheveled and a bit red from the sun. Tony, why are you here? Vanessa asked, her hair unkempt and her face showing signs of sunburn. I've thought about doing this romantically, but I just can't wait, Anthony declared, kneeling down in the narrow hallway. Vanessa, will you marry me? Surrounded by the happy faces of friends and family, Anthony felt overwhelmingly happy. As the music played, he watched Vanessa and Frank walk down the aisle on a white silk runner. Anthony's heart swelled with emotion seeing Vanessa in the elegant dress, which had once been his mother's wedding gown, worn nearly 50 years ago. So, you like the idea of her in the dress? Anthony inquired Susan after she proposed Vanessa should wear the gown. Absolutely, Susan replied. But as for you, well, I have my doubts. Just keep in mind, mother, when the time comes and your memory starts to fade, I'll be the one looking after you, Anthony reminded her teasingly. My comment, what do you think about the ending? Was it what you expected? Or you expected more the divorce to be more intense? Comment down below, sub and bell if you want to hear more of these relationship stories.